Due to technical difficulties, a portion of this presentation was not recorded. We are joining the program already in progress. Uh, that said, um, picking a good configuration library on the JVM platform, I think, is still crucial because you have to solve certain problems that most of the time, like you have like your own development configuration or your production configuration, you would like to have like a transparent solution that's gonna work in both environments transparently. Uh, our favorite uh, TypeSafe is uh, the TypeSafe config library, which I think is a great solution to these problems, but there are other good libraries out there. Go check them out. Okay. Uh, so before I, I, I talk about play, I guess it's a good time to ask, like, how many of you played with play, or how many of you like just seen play in action? Okay. So there are a few people. That's great. Uh, so I mean, the obvious question at this point, like, why we need like another framework? So uh, play one was uh, originally introduced in 2009, uh, and it came with like a few radical ideas. Uh, what kind of like uh, radical ideas I'm, I'm talking about? First of all, it came with like a rapid application development workflow, which is really similar to uh, like dynamic languages. Uh, the workflow I'm talking about um, is um, where you go to your editor, uh, whether it's like your favorite ID or like a modern uh, text editor, you make changes to your source file, you switch to the browser, you hit refresh, and your application is going to be recompiled and reloaded within the browser. If you see an error message, then the error message is going to be presented in the browser. This kind of workflow is really, really common in like that, that, that kind of the, uh, the dynamic language world, but it is something that new and play introduced, and it's really kind of increasing the developer productivity. Uh, the second thing is that uh, play uh, was one of the first frameworks that uh, really advocated uh, the container as deployment that I mentioned before. Thankfully, this is uh, bec uh, becoming more and more kind of a commonplace these days, like draft wizard is also doing that, which is another great uh, framework on the JVM. And uh, further, furthermore, uh, Play1 uh, came with like a lot of helpers that um, kind of like help you with like everyday tasks, like validating forms and uh, dealing with uh, XML, YAML, uh, or whatever file format uh, you need to use. Uh, and so these kind of features really uh, have to kind of take developer productivity to the next level. So one would wonder like why, why we went ahead and created an entering new framework uh, if we had all this kind of awesomeness. Well, uh, turns out like many things uh, have changed since 2009. Uh, the first thing uh, that obviously has changed that uh, many new front-end technologies emerged uh, since 2009. I'm talking about uh, front-end technologies like uh, LAS, CSS Transformer, CoffeeScript, uh, Google Kosher Compiler, or HTML5. The second thing is many web applications on the JVM move from mostly synchronized design with kind of uh, polling, long polling base or like just uh, short polling based strategies to more asynchronous, non blocking, uh, kind of push based ones. Uh, so that's the reason why Play 2 supports Comet, WebSocket, Event Source, and just kind of data streaming in general out of the box. Uh, the next thing uh, I would mention is that um, the, the third reason why, why we decided to have like an entire new framework is because we wanted to provide a framework which, which is not uh, kind of tied to one specific language, but it's actually tied to two languages. So Play is uh, probably the only framework uh, that uh, exists that has two native APIs, and uh, they kind of like coexist uh, kind of really nicely. Uh, so uh, that was always like a big design decision. So in Play, uh, you can use uh, a native API if you're a Java developer or a native API if you're, if you're a Scala developer. There shouldn't be a big difference other than the, uh, the, uh, the features that uh, the specific language provides. Yes? Uh, I mean, there are these differences. Uh, I, I will talk about the design kind of goals, and I think that will kind of give you a better Answer, but uh, I usually try to avoid like feature to feature <laughs> comparisons because that's somewhat misleading. Uh, so I, I guess it's, it's going to be much cleaner when, when we get to that design. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I think the easiest really is just like if you go and try both and uh, you know, try to make uh, a decision based on your own requirements. Like, uh, I don't think like one is necessarily better than the other, but uh, I mean it's hard for me to say anything, uh, considering like I'm you know working on this particular project. So, 
that's that's why I think it's not necessarily like you know kind of like a, a useful thing for me just to discuss. But there are certain differences. The easiest I think if you just really build two prototypes uh, and then just you know try to make your own decision based on that. Um, but uh, and the next thing. Um, um, so, so the third thing was like um, uh, uh, kind of providing native APIs both for Java and Scala developers. I think that's really powerful uh, thing because that bas basically allows you to start a project or uh, in one language and switch to another. Or like my, my favorite uh, kind of setup where uh, I can I can choose the tool that uh, that I think is the the best for that particular task. So. It's really easy to build like an application where uh, kind of uh, Java and, and Scala kind of uh, like uh, lives like in, in harmony, and that's a nice play application. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, like uh, we wanted to really uh, push uh, as many things to the compiler as possible. So uh, play is um, uh, it's coming with um, uh, uh, kind of new ideas um, that's uh, kind of like pushing more and more to the compiler. So basically, I'm talking about the fact that like play compiles route files. Uh, like if you ever did like the Rails or Django or uh, any other. Uh, uh, web, web development, you, I'm sure you recognize the file that it's going to tell you uh, that uh, this, if you hit this URL, then invoke this action. So many frameworks have this kind of idea. In case of play, this file is compiled. And uh, what it means in practice is that if you make a mistake in this RAD definition, that you're going to see a compilation error. Your project is not going to compile if you have uh, a typo, say, in your RAD file. And that's the same uh, for like templates as well. But besides, Besides uh, pushing templates um, and the, the right generation to the compiler, they also comes with uh, support for like front-end technologies. So what this means in practice is that like if you're a front-end developer, you're going to see exactly the same user experience that uh, I, was, uh, I was talking about, and we will see that kind of feature in action shortly. Uh, and other than that, like uh, there are all these other goodies that uh, like you would pretty much assume that uh, your framework supports. So I'm not going to go through those. OK, so, uh, so uh, Play 2 was released in February 2012. Uh, the, the, the latest release is 204. This was released yesterday. It's just a maintenance release. Uh, the next major release, which I'm really proud of, it's uh, 21. It's coming this year. Uh, that contains like more than 100 bug fixes and, uh, and a bunch of, bunch of features that uh, like, uh, I, will, uh, I will mention some of them later. We have right now about like 60 plugins, but uh, the ecosystem is uh, growing quickly, and uh, thankfully we have like a really uh, big community uh, to to work with. Uh, the project was launched in February, as I mentioned. We already have like a few big uh, kind of uh, early adapters. Uh, more to come. I'm really excited uh, that uh, we're kind of working with these companies. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea, like, uh, uh, what's the foundation for the framework? So uh, these are the open source projects that uh, we built a uh, play on, on top of. Uh, Netty, uh, we use as like uh, our uh, asynchronous HTTP library. Uh, this is working really well with Akka, which is like a, a event-driven uh, kind of uh, actor messaging framework. Uh, and basically, the, the way the framework is written, that like the core framework itself is written in Scala, uh, so we utilize uh, uh, many of the features that Scala has to offer. But we do provide like a, a kind of like a Java API on top of it, and we also uh, build heavily on HTML5, which we also consider really important to support it as much as possible. And as far as design uh, philosophy, and uh, this is the slide that I, I wanted to mention to you regarding your question. So. Uh, the, main, the most important thing for us is that we try to focus on user experience or developer experience in our case, as opposed to uh, kind of say competing on feature to feature. Uh, and uh, more specifically, we kind of came up with three goals when we designed the framework. The first goal was that simple tests should be simple, while uh, hard tests should be also possible. And, uh, and the most important point from, uh, from all of this is that uh, uh, always focus on uh, kind of developer happiness. So this is how the, that kind of developer console uh, looks like. So you basically just go to your um, uh, go to your favorite like I don't know a terminal. You, uh, you just uh, hit uh, uh, you just uh, say play, and then uh, you can launch your application within the developer console. That you can see that like now the application is running, and then if you switch to the browser. 
hit refresh, then you're going to see an error message potentially like this. So again, I, I didn't have the kind of the usual workflow where I make changes to my source file, I build a whole war file, and I wait for the, uh, wait for the container to just redeploy my application potentially in minutes. In this particular workflow, you just really make changes to your uh, source file, hit, to the, hit the browser, and potentially see an error message like this. And then you can just go back to your browser, fix the error, switch to the browser, hit refresh, and the error goes away, and you see your application in the browser. This is, this is from a browser, this error message. Uh, a similar error message uh, you're going to see uh, when there is a typo or like, um, and there is something wrong in your RAD definition. So in this particular case, uh, you can see that um, there was a problem with uh, this RAD definition. The next thing uh, I'm going to show you is uh, the kind of similar error message that you see if there is a problem in your template. Again, the, the, uh, the template is um, uh, compile check. It's using Scala, but it's kind of like a lightweight version of uh, Scala, more like, I would say, like a lightweight version of uh, GSP in a way, because it only allows you to write like certain expressions, but you can't really write like a whole application or like a whole thing like in, in Scala. It's just basically, you can just write simple expressions uh, within your template, but it is compile check. And the way it works that, uh, and we will see that shortly, that first you always define on top of your file, you define the kind of parameters for your template, and then you can ref uh, reference those uh, variables, and also you can create like what is a template text, which strategy can be familiar if you use, say, Django before. And as I mentioned, like uh, the whole framework is working in such a way that like front-end and back-end developers are uh, actually experiencing the same kind of rapid application development uh, kind of um, uh, workflow. So in this particular case, uh, you can see that like even JavaScript is somewhat compiled. What's happening behind the cur uh, curtain is that we are invoking uh, Google Closure Compiler, which uh, uh, which is giving you a, like at least like warnings if. Uh, there, uh, there is something wrong uh, in your JavaScript. Obviously, it's not the same as like a compiler, but I mean, it's more than nothing. Uh, again, what this means in practice that uh, if you try to package your whole application and if there is a JavaScript error, the package is not gonna, uh, it's not gonna uh, compile. That's like really powerful thing. Okay. So. Uh, this slide is basically just uh, showing you an example how how you can use this kind of uh, message-driven architecture in play, or like non-blocking architecture in play. So this particular example is showing you a kind of like a chat room uh, implementation using uh, Akka actors, and this particular actor is um, sending messages and receiving messages uh, to and uh, from our web socket uh, stream. Um, and uh, you can see that like this whole uh, like programming uh, programming this way is kind of giving you a, a completely new architecture uh, because instead of uh, kind of focusing on like uh, locks and synchronization, you really just focus on kind of message flow. Uh, this is how like a type safe uh, kind of uh, template uh, looks like. Uh, as I mentioned on t uh, on top, you define the kind of like the uh, uh, the variables that this particular temp uh, template accepts. What again it means, uh, if you really use this template, that if you try to pass more than one parameter or uh, a parameter, uh, an argument that's different than a form, that you're going to see a compilation error. Uh, and you, you also can see here is a, uh, that uh, there is a form helper implemented in play that lets you kind of bind and generate like a whole form tag which, which you can map back to your uh, application. The demo that I'm going to show you shortly is actually using this, so we will be able to see this in more, more details. Uh, with Play, we really take like testing seriously. So Play comes with uh, both like a functional and like a unit test uh, solution, because many of these kind of modern web applications, uh, like using JavaScript as like a f uh, kind of a first class, uh, not like necessarily language, but a first class layer. The whole kind of uh, MVC paradigm is kind of like more like extended when with an extra layer. Uh, uh, more often than not, you want to have like a functional uh, test uh, executor in, uh, in your tool, uh, toolbox because uh, it's, uh, certain features are really hard to test uh, without the JavaScript layer. So this particular test is just basically showing you how to use uh, like a, a, a 
kind of like an in-memory database with your particular application and using um, uh, just HTML unit. Uh, be using like a, a version of Selenium uh, driver. So anything that Selenium driver supports, we also support. So you actually, you can run this particular test uh, in your browser, but this one is using HTML unit, which is a headless browser with minimal JavaScript uh, implementation. But as I mentioned, nothing's stopping you from using Chrome or Firefox for your functional tests. Uh, one of, uh, one of the things that uh, we really uh, wanted to take seriously from day one is that uh, uh, while we provide you uh, like a few ideas, what we think is kind of like the best practices as far as uh, templating or routing is concerned, uh, we kind of recognize that like uh, you may have different ideas or you may have different preference when it comes to say templates or, or, uh, or routes or anything else that we provide. Uh, so we made it really easy just to swap out any components that uh, that we provide. So it's kind of like we, we, we give you like the, the kind of like this is what we think is the best option, and that you can basically pick and choose whatever you want. So if you don't like uh, our Scala-based templates, but you prefer Velocity or FreeMarker or whatever Java uh, templating solution you like, it's really easy to plug in. Like the, there is no special treatment for our template uh, solution other than that we, that's, that's the one that we recommend and should play with. But there is nothing stopping you from using anything you want. If you don't like the routing solution, th there are hooks that let you uh, uh, swap out our routing implementation and then you can use anything you want. There is no single component in the play architecture that can be swapped out at this point. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we, we made it really easy that uh, users can write plugins. In this particular case, uh, this is just showing you how you can uh, access the, the Jedis plugin. Jedis is just like a driver for the Redis uh, key value store. Uh, we use uh, uh, this plugin in my demo. So this is just uh, giving you an idea how you, can, uh, how you can access it from your application. All right, so let's uh, dive into an actual uh, application. So I'm going to leave my presentation here. All right, so um, what we're going to do here is just like, so I'm going to walk you through like an application. I will make like a few changes, and uh, if time permits, I will just deploy to Heroku, so just to make it like something uh, worthwhile. So I'm just going to fire up my editor but you could use like Eclipse or IntelliJ or uh, even NetBeans, I think. Um, so the heart of um, every play application is the RAT file. Um, but as you can see, the, the, the kind of the application structure that we recommend, which by the way also can be easily aware with, and this is just a, rec this is just a recommendation, uh, that you can see that like you recognize the standard like MVC uh, kind of uh, design pattern. So you see control S models and, uh, and views as well. So no surprise that like our templates like uh, sitting basically inside views, but uh, you can see that like we have one controller and I'm gonna show you models as well. So this is our application, pretty standard. Like even if you don't know play, this should give you an idea uh, how the application is structured. In fact, that was the main, I, uh, main uh, reason why we kind of uh, still kind of stick with like MVC. Uh, even though it's really easy just to uh, create this kind of like four layer setup where the front end is a significant part of your application. So the easiest to understand like a play application is through this file because th this file is kind of mapping HTTP uh, to, to your application. So just to walk you through what we're seeing here, we have uh, one uh, controller method uh, called index, which is the index page. Uh, it takes like a message, uh, and uh, like as you can see, you can create like default uh, messages. But uh, if you if you check the last line, you also can see that like uh, uh, in this particular case, we said that uh, if the user is providing like a message uh, query string, then that uh, that should override that message that we, uh, uh, we provided by default. So in other words, like if you hit index, you're gonna see hello Java one. Uh, if you hit uh, index and you provide a message query string, then that string is going to override hello Java in 2012. Uh, the list uh, URI, uh, the list URI, URI uh, is mapped to like list users uh, control action, and we have also a post um, 
which is basically uh, just going to take care of uh, the situation where uh, then uh, like a user is recorded. Uh, let me show you the application as well. I guess that's uh, the easiest. So I'm going to fire up the development console. It, it's complaining about um, uh, kind of the, the version differences, but that's just because I'm using like a cutting edge version here for this demo. You usually wouldn't see that. So I'm going to fire up the application. So now the application is running. I also have my Redis server sitting here, so that's all I got here. So I'm going to. Okay, so this is the application that we're talking about. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's just basically showing you uh, like the, the intro screen, and then uh, you can just see like a user, and then there is a simple thing, just simple way just to list users. So that's that's all. I put together this like in one hour or something. So it's really easy just to create something like this. So right now there aren't like any users recorded. So I guess I can record one like. Uh, oops, yeah, Peter. Okay, should work. Okay, so now this is listing now showing one user. Let me go back to the index page and I'm just going to show you that there is also some validation. Right, so I, uh, I missed both. So then uh, that's not good. Let me just try to come up with uh, an invalid email address. I'm going to try to say the user is going to say that the, uh, the email is invalid. Okay, <coughs> so nothing fancy. I, uh, I think, um, okay, so that's the application that, uh, that we're talking about. So uh, you, you, from one hand you get the uh, index page, you get like a list view and you can save a user, that's all. So let's see how it works in, in, uh, uh, behind the curtain. So let's start with the, the index page and I'm going to walk you through the whole workflow. That's good. So this is your controller. Pretty simple. Uh, this particular, in this particular example, I, cho uh, I, I chose a technique called like uh, static uh, binding. So like my, uh, my um, uh, uh, controller methods returning like a, st uh, a, st a static, um, Oh, so my control methods are static methods. However, if you prefer to use like Spring or Juice and kind of manage controller uh, lifecycle, you can also do that. So in this particular example, I just switch to uh, this demo project. You can see how Spring uh, can be used with uh, Play. So very obvious, you're not going to see the kind of static methods there. Everything is managed just like a Spring beam. You can do the same thing with the uh, Juice or uh, you can do this even manually, which is what I usually do uh, if I'm going to use um, like uh, injection. Okay. I mean, obviously the benefit uh, here is that like because it's statically bind, like uh, if anything bad happens, then you see the issue immediately. While uh, with uh, with like any dependency injection, you would see the issue more like at runtime. So you can really uh, get uh, some benefit from the st uh, st uh, static methods here. But anyway, it's a matter of preference. Uh, so let's let's start with the index page. So what you see here is that like uh, the index um, uh, the index method is taking like a string, uh, and then basically just saying that like let's render uh, the view with the, with this particular uh, uh, with this particular form, which is just like an empty form, and that particular message. So let's see that. Uh, index form. So that's just to give you an idea. Again, the form we're talking about is just this one. Right, so this is the form we're talking about. Uh, so this form, uh, uh, as you recall, takes two parameters. One is the form itself and the other one is um, the kind of just the message that we just uh, show. Uh, and uh, what you see here is that like we have like a kind of like a so-called template tag that's basically containing the layout of the, the template and then just uh, kind of pretty simple template logic. One extra thing I would mention is that uh, Play is supporting a feature called uh, reverse routing. So instead of hard coding URLs uh, both in your JavaScript or, and in your templates, 
in play, you can just reference the actions, and that also generates like compiler errors if you make a, an issue here. So you never have to deal with like URLs in your templates. That allows you full flexibility when it comes to changing your URLs over time. Uh, this feature can be really familiar if you uh, done any Rails development, say, where, where you also see that. Uh, what, we, what we have uh, more than this is that uh, this is actually working for JavaScript as well. So if you have JavaScript callbacks, we generate JavaScript that, uh, that's actually using the sim a similar technique to kind of hide the URLs from you. So you can always just change your RAT file and uh, your application should be working. But as I mentioned, this is compile check. So let me show what that means. So obviously this, not, this shouldn't be working. So I'm just hitting the browser here. And now it's complaining that uh, uh, that there isn't like a method code list, right? So that's true. So I'm gonna fix that. Refresh the browser, and then the application was uh, recompiled and reloaded. But I'm gonna show you the same feature that like uh, when when I have like a Java issue here. So it's complaining that like, oh, oh, yeah, there is something wrong. So let me fix that. I'm switching to my browser, uh, switching to my editor. I'm fixing the error. I save the file, switch to the browser, hit refresh. What you don't see here is the, the kind of traditional JVM workflow where uh, you make changes to your, uh, uh, to your source files, uh, build a whole war, and wait for the conti container to redeploy. This is, uh, the whole thing is like seamless. So just make changes and switch to the browser, and I should see the compilation errors for the application uh, that I'm working on. Okay, so that was uh, that was a template. Now let's see like a form really quickly. I don't know. Just let me see how much time I still have. Time that's good. Um, so um, if you recall that uh, we had this form, right? Um, so what happens if you if you submit that form? Uh, play comes with like a, kind of like a form helper and the validator framework. The validator framework is based on Spring uh, validator. So anything you can do with Spring uh, validator, uh, you can do with uh, play. Uh, so uh, essentially, what's happening here is that like we bind uh, the form request uh, to this kind of form object, and then we run the validation through it. And if there was any error, uh, then we kind of rendering a request. Uh, where we say that like something was wrong with your form, or alternatively, we first check whether a user with the same email address already exists. If that's the case, so I'm uh, I'm talking about like save um, save user and like user find user. Uh, then if the user already exists uh, with the same email address, uh, then we we uh, render this page with a different error message. But if things going well, then we're just going to render the page uh, with like an OK uh, 200 and a different form. So that's the, that's the kind of control layer. And let's see the implementation of uh, the model. So this is the model that we have here. Uh, this is the, the kind of uh, um, uh, spring um, annotation that uh, I was talking about. So we say that in this particular case that uh, we're using the uh, email validator that, uh, that we have. And then we also say that like name should be required. So that's the kind of annotation we have on, uh, on name. And then uh, other than that, uh, uh, I added like the DEO kind of uh, uh, helper uh, methods here. Uh, the first thing that you see here is that like we get like, access to this kind of Redis plugin that uh, I configured for my application. This is a really simple key value store, kind of like a simplified uh, 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 database, if you will. Uh, so it, it's pretty simple, and that's uh, that's the reason why I, I chose it. And Heroku also supports it, so that's that's a big uh, win. But um, so what you see here, like uh, this is the kind of like the fine user, simply DEO method. So, that, so we get like a, a, a JDBC resource. Uh, it's kind of like a similar idea to like JDBC. So you get a resource. If something is going wrong, that you have to make sure that you close the connection. Otherwise, you're going to have like a hanging connection. So JDBC is working kind of similarly to uh, JDBC. 
and then we basically just uh, uh, get like an email address from uh, Redis, and because Redis only supports like string type, uh, uh, like we have to kind of serialize the data there in this particular case. Uh, so that's that's pretty much it for uh, for find user. Uh, when we kind of uh, try to retrieve all the users, uh, the idea is very similar. So we just get all the uh, all the data from Redis for that particular um, for, for for all the users, and then we just kind of deserialize from that kind of internal format that I came up with. Nothing fancy here. If there was an exception, then we just print the exception and return nothing. And then uh, finally, we have like uh, like um, the kind of like the serialization logic there when we just try to save a user. So pretty straightforward, I guess. And so let's try to make a change. So now I'm going to just deploy this. Yeah. Okay, and then so this was my application. I'm gonna just uh, see right here. Demo time. I'm just gonna push to Heroku. I don't know how fast it's gonna be. Let me see. Um, while we're waiting, I'm gonna show you uh, another feature. I don't know uh, why it's so slow. Maybe my internet connection. So I'm going to show you like uh, the test runner, which I think is also kind of interesting and certainly valuable. So tests uh, are kept in the test folder. We have like a functional test for this particular application. And uh, what uh, what we're doing here is that like we fire up like a whole application in contest context uh, uh, against that port, like 3333, using HTML unit, which is a headless browser. And we have a callback, which uh, I'm hoping that uh, it's going to go away uh, once, we, uh, once we had uh, Java 8 support. And, uh, and then just we run our functional test, uh, which pretty much just basically checks uh, whether a certain string is there. Right now, like it says that like whether uh, Dreamforce is there, because uh, that particular test was there. But let's change that, say, to Java 1. And then I'm going to run the test and see what we have. Hopefully, it's going to run. I think it's going to fail because it's not there, but I'm going to fix that uh, really quickly and hoping that. So it's just compiling the tests. It should fail, rightly so, because this page didn't have a Java, a Java 1 2012 one word. And that's right. So I had to add the space. Let's see what we got here. In the meantime, I'm going to see, OK, so Heroku is doing his thing. So I'm going to rerun the functional test. And uh, it says that uh, the functional test was indeed working uh, since now I fixed the, uh, fixed the test. OK, so hopefully it's going to be live soon. And this is where it lives. But while we're waiting for oh, Heroku, yeah, so this is the application. I don't know why it's not loading the whole thing. I don't know what's, why it's not loading the whole page. But uh, so, in, but anyway, so uh, you would see the same thing that uh, that I just um, uh, have here. I, I don't know why it's not uh, doing the same thing on Heroku. But uh, while waiting, um, then do, you, do you guys have any questions? So that was pretty much the, the demo part. And then before I wrap it up, I take questions. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which point? 
I mean, so uh, the way that the test is working, that like you can basically just set up your mock whatever for every single test, so you, you have to just reset state. But uh, I mean, the, the whole thing is basically uh, uh, like it's still giving you the option. If you if you don't like static methods, you can just avoid them. So it it, it is an option. Uh, what you get with them is like you can avoid like certain kind of runtime exceptions. But the strategy is the same that you would do with like uh, an, in a normal situation. You have to set up your state before you run your test, and then then you run your test one by one. That's not running in parallel, so uh, so you wouldn't have like. Uh, any issues with that. But uh, as I said, it's a matter of pre preference. You, you are not forced to use static methods. But that's a good question. Yes? Um, if, you, uh, if you're developing with Eclipse, with the, the Eclipse plugin and everything, uh, I vaguely remember when I um, wrote those templates that, well, at that moment, it was not really kind of nice syntax highlighting. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you're using this editor and it shows you nice kind of yeah. problems and stuff like that, and maybe also completion for some types of. Uh, <coughs> is it supported in the Eclipse plugin already? Uh, uh, in fact, like there is a. Because you have these, uh, also you have these uh, add symbols and stuff like that, so it's mm. a playlist. That's an excellent question. Uh, about two weeks ago, uh, we just launched our kind of experimental. Uh, uh, feature uh, and the release for uh, supporting uh, syntax highlighting and uh, some context uh, kind of dependent helpers in the Eclipse plugin. Uh, this plugin is not tied to kind of the Scala ID at all, so you can just download uh, that as a separate uh, kind of plugin. So you have to just add the, the, the type safe uh, Eclipse nightly uh, kind of URL to your Eclipse uh, kind of uh, update sites, and then uh, that you can uh, have uh, syntax highlighting for your route files and syntax highlighting for your templates as well. And you also get navigation. Which, uh, so it's not just like basically syntax highlighting, but you can in Eclipse in your <coughs> RAT file. Yeah. Uh, by the way, so yes, you say it's independent from the Eclipse plugin, but probably to a vehicle operator. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's it's independent. No, the, the, I mean, the, the, the main idea uh, here is that, like, and that's the reason why it's kind of uh, a separate part of the idea that, uh, like, I mean, if you're just uh, using a plain vanilla uh, Eclipse and you're not interested in Scala, you can just install these as a kind of play Java user. As I said, like, for us, it's really important that we don't want to really have this uh, kind of, uh, uh, we don't want to make a distinction between, like, oh, you know, these are like Scala developers or Java developers. If you want to use Java, that's really cool. We love Java. So use Java and we try to make sure that you can use whatever you want. I was saying that you, you, you showed that the only way to provide could be via the Eclipse plugin, but you could actually say, well, if you're Scala, if you're using Scala anyway, and you can use complete style stack anyway, then we could not give a solution where everything is included. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, should be. Any other questions? Yes. Was that just for your first third IntelliJ plugin already? Uh, thankfully, um, IntelliJ users uh, help us with uh, with votes, and now, uh, like uh, um, IntelliJ uh, started working on Play Two uh, templates and RAT support, and there is an alpha release already out. I think it's just supporting RAT files, but uh, but the uh, like thanks to the community, like uh, now we we got voting into the. Uh, kind of system, so now it's kind of like a high priority. So uh, apparently, people are working on it. By the yes. way, your live application is ever running? Maybe yeah, I, I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> yeah, it came up. I was uh, I was surprised. It was like actually a Heroku thing. Yeah, I don't know why it's. Yeah, but the internet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. I was really surprised what was going on. Uh, but yeah, that's it. If you guys don't have any other questions, I have stickers and buttons, and we also uh, have like a booth. Like, if you guys have any extra questions, don't hesitate to uh, look out for me. Yes. So it seems like this is geared more towards uh, visual web applications. Does it also work well for web APIs, RESTful APIs? Yeah, I mean, our biggest user is cloud, and they're doing like two billion requests. Uh, I don't know. I think a day. I, I don't know the number, but yeah, I mean, they're using it just for uh, for the web tier. What they're really uh, using it for is just because uh, we have all these kind of helpers and like the, the test runner and also this kind of rapid application development thing. You still can take advantage of that uh, even if you're just building like a, a web 
uh, kind of layer on uh, on well, so the web API. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so in case of uh, cloud, I just can uh, use them again as an example. Like they just uh, returning like JSON. JSON support is built in, so that's pretty standard setup. But it's usually like your like design, design decision whether you want to just uh, build your like web API in in play. In, in which particular case, of course, like you can take advantage of uh, all this kind of uh, nice uh, uh, kind of like streaming and stuff like that. But I mean, it depends on your really like your. Um, your framework because like I mean if you support certain thing then like you can even use like say uh, asynchronous streaming like that's something that uh, even if you just build an API if you want to stream data you still can use that you just for example with a comet implementation or the websocket implementation would require probably more like a, a full play application but that's pretty common to the API I think Yes. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to the presentation. So uh, two one is coming uh, uh, coming approximately around like November, December. Like we're targeting like DevOps for uh, for the the first RC, but certainly going to happen this year. Uh, the, uh, one of the really exciting uh, features is that we just we're going to have like scaffolding and project templates. What it means is that uh, uh, if you ever use like Rails. Uh, before then like I'm sure you're familiar with this kind of code uh, uh, generation so like it's giving you like say like a nice controller like a nice application thing out of the box so you will be able to generate certain kind of snippets and you can also create your own snippets uh, so you can share it with your teammates and the project template is kind of like a similar idea I mentioned that uh, we just give, give our recommendation as far as what kind of components you should use because if you have project templates you can just um, basically create your own project template with your own defaults with your own templates uh, kind of wire template engine wired up and then you see that like in my team this is the template we use in fact the standard play template is just going to be one of these kind of templates, but there, there isn't going to be anything special about that. It's kind of like really similar to Rails, where the Rails team also just says that like this is our recommendation, but uh, I think in Rails it's called engine. Um, so then you also can just create your own thing, and in your organization, this, these are the defaults that that you're going to use. Uh, so that's scaffolding and um, project. Um, uh, we we working on like uh, modularization as well. So like just to make sure that like uh, 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 again, if you if you say uh, using NoSQL uh, like data store, you don't want to use JDBC and stuff like that. So we make sure that like you really have just a minimum uh, kind of uh, requirement for for uh, for your project in, on your class path. Uh, we we uh, we try to optimize the kind of the rapid application development workflow more. Uh, that's pretty exciting. And uh, the next thing that uh, this really kind of uh, going to change the whole thing is that you will be able to define routes in sub projects. So, uh, I mean, especially uh, some of our early adapters really got to a point where their route file was like too big, and instead of really uh, kind of focusing on that, like we want to focus on modularization. So, you will be able to have sub routes, and like uh, basically you can define routes in separate sub projects, and you can have mini play applications that you kind of wire up together. And, uh, and that's uh, that's already in uh, at two one. Uh, we're gonna have like SSL support. Uh, right now we have some uh, limited support on master, but uh, for two one final there is gonna be like a full fledged HTTPS support as well. And uh, and on, on the kind of front end level we have uh, required JS support, which is providing you like e EMD kind of uh, dependency loading mechanism for it, for JavaScript. I really like that specific feature, and we, we already use it in production. Is there any Maven support, or how does, how does Maven, does Maven play with uh, So the, the, way, the way the whole build system works is that you can actually publish an artifact. So you're, you, you can package up your whole application as an artifact. You can publish your artifact. Uh, 
as, as a Maven artifact, but I mean, it's not using Maven, it's using a different build tool, but you can use every single uh, artifact from Maven or Ivy, and you can also publish as Ivy or Maven, but it's not using Maven itself. Uh, yes. So it's just a jar file that you can publish through this uh, uh, publish uh, uh, through this beer tool called SBT, uh, and um, and the SBT like uh, lets you reuse any existing Maven or IV artifacts, and you also can publish everything as IV or Maven as well. Uh, no, that's that's uh, that's what we got right now. Actually, somebody uh, from the community created like a Maven plugin. I would recommend to check it out. Uh, that's um, and and uh, talking about uh, plugins. So one of the things that uh, we also try to improve uh, is uh, is that like right now it's kind of hard to uh, explore and find plugins for for Play. So one of the things that we we, we try to address uh, for the release of two one is to have like a Chrome store. Firefox add-on kind of experience for play plugins, where you can read plugins, you can see which plugin is maintained, and so the ecosystem is certainly something that uh, we are uh, going to focus on for for the launch. Yes. And you have some uh, figures about, for example, clients who are using play in medium-sized or large projects, where let me just say something they. They change something in their CSS file. How long does it take before they see it in their browser for a medium size to to launch uh, web application? I mean, uh, we, we actually more uh, constrained by like the, sp uh, the underlying technology. So like uh, uh, in certain s uh, situations, say if you use um, a less transformer or uh, kind of coffee script or Google Closure, like uh, the, our our strategy is that like we always try to use the Rhino implementation of these things by default because that allows you just to download the package and just use it as a standalone thing. But we always always try to make sure that you can use the native. Uh, Compilers. So some of these things like require JS or, uh, or the even I think less uh, or, or Coffee Script certainly allows you to use like a native uh, compiler, and we always make sure that you can plug in those, which would give you performance boost. So what the bigger side is doing, like uh, instead of using the the Rhino version, uh, which of course is slower because Rhino is not the fastest uh, uh, JavaScript engine on the planet. Uh, uh, like you can just plug in the native version and then you use that. What you lose is portability, so you have to really make sure that like every developer has that uh, like I don't know native um, kind of compiler or native uh, thing installed on their desktops. And, and you also have this nifty technology to kind of stream data in, in an intelligent way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is it, is it only this is used for kind of streaming data? But if you have to, if you have to upload a huge amount of data, which could sometimes be the case, is it, is it also using similar things? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, everything is kind of be, uh, built on that idea. But you can stream data like the way you want. Like, I mean, data it's streaming. Not only when something comes in, but if you post, uh, if you have to post an enormous amount of data, is that? I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, so say, um, I don't know, I try to give you like a somewhat uh, realistic example. So say uh, you have to read like a whole image into your uh, application. You want to upload that image to S3 at the same time, right? So the way you would do it like uh, without uh, this kind of advanced I.O. handling techniques that you would need to read everything to memory and then just uh, kind of, you know, write it to S3 or like many times what you do, you actually write you read everything to memory and then write it to disk and upload it to S3. What you can do with this advanced I.O. handling that you can actually send S3 data in chunks. So the way you receive uh, an image, you send it to S3. And then if S3 is slow, then you just wait a bit, that you get more data, you send that without you loading the whole image okay, uh, to memory. I know that technique, but I thought it was only when you received it, but also for sending Yeah. Yes. Is there a way to Yeah, I mean, so uh, the, 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 the kind of plug-in thing is one way to kind of uh, create reusable things. But uh, now, because uh, route, uh, route files can be stored in any sub-projects, you can create mini applications, mini components that actually have the same 
structure like a play app. You can even share mini play components uh, as of two one. But uh, otherwise, it's just because we're using a, a Maven IV compatible dependency thing. The normal uh, kind of the normal way of sharing components applies, which is you just publish like a jar and just uh, you know reference that jar in your uh, build file. But you can use sub uh, sub components and sub play projects now as uh, dependencies as well, which is pretty powerful thing. Anything else? No? Yes? Is the uh, form space concept of inputs and widgets but like Django's or is it all the template offers? Yeah, it's, it's very Django like. So we have like uh, template tags that we shift with the framework, but users, that's the other way to kind of share. Uh, kind of stuff that you, uh, there are users who actually sharing uh, template tags the same way as in Django, I believe. I mean, it's been a while when I worked with Django, but. So if I wanted to say we use the GH4J to write template layer, I would reusable any template Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, so essentially the, the way it works is that we just sh uh, ship play with a few helpers. So that form helper that you saw, that was, that was just an ordinary template tag, there was no special treatment there. You can just create your own and package it as a jar and even though it's just uh, like a HTML file and, uh, and just uh, distribute it within your team. All right, thank you guys. And if uh, any one of you need stickers, I have stickers and buttons. Thank you.